Shabbat Shalom everyone! Welcome to Congregation Yeshua Story Studies and this week's story portion is called by Yitzhak in English and he sent. If you are new to the channel, we are a Messianic congregation based in Mississauga, Ontario. For service times and location, um, you can uh, send us an email at congregation underscore yeshua at rogers.com or you can send us a text. You can visit our website. We are located at the Paramount Fine Food Center, formerly the Hershey, Hershey Center. Again, if you haven't uh, read this book, I encourage you to do so. It's that end time book relating to why we need to go back to our Jewish roots and understanding that we serve and worship the Jewish Messiah named Yeshua HaMashiach. For our Torah's Portion it's taken from Genesis chapter 32 verse 4 to chapter 36 verse 43. Again, many many insights. We don't have time to go over each one of them, and we'll do our best to cover as much insights as possible. Um, so we'll uh, we'll start out by going back to last week's store portion where Jacob. Uh, is uh, returning to the land of Israel, the promised land in Genesis chapter 32, verse 2, verse 2 and 3. Remember that when Jacob went on his way, the angels of God met him. So it's very interesting. As Jacob crosses over to the promised land, he uh, he goes over the border. What does he do? He runs oh, runs into a camp of angels. And notice the reaction of Jacob. Jacob was not shocked, Jacob was not scared, Jacob did not worship the angels. And Jacob said when he saw the angels, wow, this is God's camp. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. So, so again, no reaction, no, you know why? Because uh, the appearance of angels is normal when, during that time with when he was with Isaac, with Abraham. And also when he was in Laban's territory. So in verse 4, what's interesting, Jacob then, what does he do? He sends the, in the Hebrew there is Malachim, meaning he sends the angels before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, the field of Edom. So he commanded them saying, Thus shall you say unto my lord Esau, Thus says thy servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now. So, so Jacob, uh, commissions the angels, gives them a mission. Uh, so, you know, we don't, uh, the Jewish people don't worship angels. Why? Because angels are, are our helper sent by God. And in fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, moreover, to which the angels, as he never said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Aren't they merely spirits who serve, sent out to help those whom God will deliver? So there are messengers for their helper for us. So so um, in verse 6, this is interesting. Uh, he mentions about, I have oxen, I have asses or donkeys and flocks and maid servants and ma uh, men servants and maid servants. And we're going to look at the significance of the gifts of Jacob later on. But he, so the messengers, verse 7, returned to Jacob saying, We came to your brother Esau, moreover he cometh to meet you and four hundred of his men. So here Jacob finds out um, that, you know, um, Esau is, uh, is uh, not forgetting what he has done to him 20 years ago. This has been 20 years. It's been 20 years of hard labor. And what happened? What happened to Jacob? Got distressed. Jacob was greatly afraid and was distressed. So you see here, uh, why was Jacob frightened? Didn't we just read that he just uh, he just encountered two camps of angels? In Rabbi Monk's insight in verse five, he charged them that Binrash um, uh, Tankuma, the angels are subordinate to the righteous. Again, Jews don't worship angels. That's why in second in Colossians chapter two, uh, Saul, uh, Saul Paul said he was admonishing them not to fall into the world on this uh, this uh, this world religion of that worshiping of angels as Jews don't worship angels. So so when Jacob had resorted to the angels, he took them 
He took some of their camps and gave them orders and sent them to Esau, and they obeyed the righteous man. So the angels came back, and Jacob was frightened. Think about it. Why was Jacob frightened? Why did he just commission angels to uh, to um, to help him? Why was he was why was he afraid? Why why because he was just a human being. As much as he has a lot of faith, he had great faith. He is also a human. That's why, you know, people are saying, "Oh, the Messiah is just human." There is no way. Why? Because even the greatest human that has the greatest faith, we talk about Abraham. You talk about Moses, you talk about now Jacob, Isaac, all these great men of faith, all of them fail. That's why uh, a human Messiah is not possible. That's why God himself had to come. That's the mystery. God himself had to come down and save mankind. That's why the very first commandment actually is not a commandment in Exodus chapter 19. It said, I am the Lord your God, what? Who redeemed you out of the house of bondage, out of the house of Egypt. So God is saying that he is the one that redeemed us. Um, not man. Not, man cannot save us. That's why you know, there's no man that can save us. So so uh, Jacob, remember Jacob, he, he, you know, he was a man of great faith. And yet when he heard that his brother has not forgiven him and he's coming with 400 of his men to kill him, he got afraid. Uh, remember Elijah when he when he confronted the the, the prophets of Baal 400 plus of 400 400 of them and challenged them challenged them into a who can bring fire from heaven and and you, you see the story a man of great faith you know he was the only one against 400 prophets false prophets and what happened uh, the 400 false prophets were not able to to, uh, to command the fire to come down from heaven and, and Elijah with a short prayer with a with the help of of the children of Israel when they poured you know uh, the 12 uh, gallons of water you know four times uh, four times three times so four times three is 12 so every tribe contributed to that water and the miracle happened the fire came down from heaven. And then what immediately happened after that, he slew all the false pro false prophets of Baal. And what happened? Jezebel heard and threatened his life. And what did Elijah do? The man of great faith, the man who was able to, to make fire come down from heaven. What did he do? He ran away in fear of his life. You see, so again, a man of God, a man of God. So why? You know, it's an encouragement for you and I. You know, we... we um, uh, we, 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 we come to a situation, we come into a uh, desperate situation, and sometimes we forget who God is. We forget that we, we serve a mighty God, a miracle-working God. But again, this uh, God allows this thing. See, see, see the reaction of Jacob. Jacob was greatly afraid and was distressed. And look at verse 10. In verse 10, and Jacob Pray. Jacob came to Hashem. And sometimes God allows trials, God allows tribulation to happen in our lives. Why? So that we will remember to get down on our knees. We will remember to call on the mighty God. And here is exactly what Jacob did. God of my father Abraham, the God of my father Isaac. O Lord, you said unto me, return unto my country and to my kindred and I will do the good. I'm not worthy of all your mercies. So here God, uh, Jacob is reminding um, God of his love and his mercies on all the truth which you have shown thy servant. For he said, I came with my staff, passed over this Jordan, and now I become two cups. So God, uh, Jacob is reminding Hashem, reminding, his, uh, reminding God, God, you know, when when I came out of the land of Israel, I, I only had my shirt and my staff. And now look, in the land uh, where, where uh, in the la the pagan land, the land where they were serving other gods, you blessed me there in the midst of all the paganism, in the midst of all the idolatry. And yet you were able to bless me. Now I come back with not just one camp, but with two camps. So he's reminding God, you've been faithful to me then in the land of the wicked. Now I'm coming into your land. So he said, deliver me, I pray, verse 12, to the, to the, uh, uh, from the hand of my brother. 
and from the hand of Esau, for I fear him lest he come and smite me and the mother, the, the mother, the mother with the children. So, so here again, you know what happened when Jacob was distressed? Verse ten. Jacob prayed. This is a lesson for us again. You know, um, this the the, the 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 Torah is teaching us life principles. The, the Torah is teaching us, you know, we can have great faith, but we can we can also have subject ourselves to human emotions, fear and doubt. But here, and then what happens when the situation like this comes? What do we do? We need to go down on our knees. We humble ourselves and pray, seek the face of Hashem. And so, so trials it says here come why to remind us that perhaps we have been enjoying our life so much that we have forgotten Hashem. Isn't that true, right? You know, in good times, that's why uh, the Jews make it make it a practice, you know, in the happiest times, you know, it, it's it, the happiest time in, in, a, in a man or in a woman's life is in their wedding. So in their wedding, what do they do? They get a glass and they smash it with their feet. Why? 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 What? Why is that tradition? What is the per reason for the tradition? Why? Because to remind them of the bitterness of losing the temple. So, so in the happiest times, they remember Hashem. Hashem, we remember. We remember our failings. We remember the darkest days of our lives, the darkest days of the Jewish people, and uh, and and that's how. That's why that tradition ha uh, occurred. Why? Because in the happiest times, God is saying. You don't forget me in your low because in in our lowest point for sure we will have to humble ourselves but oh but but we're saying god even in our happiest days we will remember you so so here trial challenges reminds us to humble ourselves to get down on our knees reminds ourselves that all these things all these things are from hashem good things or bad things happen in our life god allows it why because we are able he's not he said he will not give us beyond what we are able it's not uh, a promise in his word you know he will not tempt us beyond what we are able but with the temptation will provide a way for us to escape or to 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 find our way out of it we need to come back to him how by repentance and it's a daily walk it's a daily walk. It's not a once a week. It's not a once a year and once a month. It's a daily seeking the face of Hashem. Amen. So again, we back to the gifts. He, he, the, he, we said, I'm going to give you bulls or oxen. Actually, the word was given oxen. I'll give you uh, donkeys. I give you flocks and I give you manservant and maid, uh, maidservant. So so here there's a, there's, a, um, there's an allusion to the gifts that Jacob gave. So uh, Jace, uh, Jacob gives Esau gifts. Why? Again, wh why was the gift so lavish? Why? Because Jacob was compensating for Esau selling the birthright. Remember when Esau parted with his birthright, he didn't understand or didn't care about the value, but he parted. He thought that the bowl of soup was fair price for the birthright. And Jacob knew better. Jacob knew that there's a, that, that Esau parted with a very invaluable uh, um, gift. That's why although Esau accepted it, he was not commensurate to the blessing so Jacob repaid Esau by way of the lavish gifts so uh, but there's some symbolism here, interesting symbolism it says here the bull the oxen um, the oxen uh, is symbolic remember Esau represents Rome Esau represents Christianity uh, the Western civilization the oxen refers to the Messiah son of Joseph as Moses said in his blessing to the tribe of Yosef, he said on the tribe of Yosef, the blessing, verse 30, uh, 17 of Deuteronomy chapter 33 says, In the first links, Bullock, majesty is his. Talking about uh, Messiah ben Yosef, you know, the first coming of the Messiah. And his horns are the horns of the wild ox. With them he, will sh he shall gore the peoples, all of them. Even the ends of the earth, they are the are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. So here again, what is it symbolic? The bulls often refer to the Messiah, son of Joseph, as Moses said in the blessing of the tribe of Joseph. 
So what does that mean? The Messiah is to come first, referring to his first coming, the suffering servant, Messiah ben Yosef. The atonement and redemption work of Yeshua penetrates into the hearts of people even today, even unto the ends of the earth. Amen. So, so again, so the, the, the atonement and redemption work of Yeshua penetrates even, even today, the hearts of all men, not just the Jewish people, all men. Amen. The donkey, um, um, the donkey is uh, symbolism uh, of the Messiah ben, ben David, the, 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 uh, as stated in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Remember when Yeshua entered Jerusalem on the tent of Nisan. The, the, he entered the tent of Nisan uh, four days before the Passover. Why? And we learn that uh, 10 days uh, before the Passover, on the Nisan 14, the, uh, the lamb is to be taken into the home. Why? To inspect whether or not there is any blemish or there's any defect so here he says here rejoice greatly o daughter of zion shout o daughter of jerusalem behold the king cometh unto thee he is triumphant victorious lowly and riding upon an ass or a donkey so here we, we learn that yeshua they said he came in on the tent of nisan he entered jerusalem the lamb prepared for a sacrifice uh, and, and immediately as he entered, what happened? The religious leaders began to question him. What are they doing? Why were they asking all these questions? Why uh, prophetically or unknowingly they were examining whether the lamb is with defect. So they asking questions upon questions upon question. And each time Yeshua answered them and they could not find any fault in him. So again, there was no defect. He was a perfect sacrifice. Um, the flocks is symbolic of who? The children of Israel. The children of Israel is um, in Ezekiel 34 verse 31. And you, and you talking about Israel, my sheep, the sheep of my pasture are men. And I am your God, says the Lord God. So the, the flocks refer to the people of Israel as, um, as um, true followers. Remember, uh, many, 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 um, many uh, Jews were forced converted to Christianity during um, the during the, uh, the, the the 1700s, the 1600s, with the persecution of Jewish people. Um, so they end up in Rome. They end up to be uh, among the uh, among. Um, it's either you convert, you get killed, or you you uh, you had to leave the country. And many many had to be forced converted. And uh, the, the the servants refer um, the servants uh, refer to the God fearing Gentiles that will be grafted into Israel, as, as said stated in Deuteronomy chapter twenty nine verse ten, talking about uh, the people, the little ones, your wives, the stranger that is in the midst of thy camp, even the ewer of the wood and the drawer of water. So in verse eleven, that thou shouldest enter into the covenant of the Lord. So God's covenant is not restricted to the Jewish people. It's restricted to whomsoever, whomsoever, including the strangers among us. So we are to graft ourselves into Israel. Why? Because Israel is the covenant people and we are to covenant, covenant people of God. If you want to be um, the, the, the chosen people of God, we need to covenant ourselves with Israel. So um, we get into uh, Genesis chapter 32, verse 25. And Jacob uh, wrestled, he was left alone, and there he wrestled a man with him, with him until the breaking of the dawn. So here we see here that Jacob was wrestling, and, and there's many, many different interpretation insights as to who this person was he was wrestling. Was he wrestling with a man? I was wrestling uh, in 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 uh, the 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 rabbinic literature have different interpretation. Some say Jacob was wrestling with a demon, which is unlikely. Some say that he was wrestling with Esau's angel or Esau's spirit. 
that likely but it's not likely based on the plain meaning when you start reading the text some say he was uh, wrestling with archangel michael uh, but when you look at the uh, rabbinic literature especially in the zohar every time the angel michael is mentioned the archangel mentioned sometimes it also is referring to Memtet. Who is Memtet? Memtet is the head of the angels. Memtet is the only angel, the leader of the angels that is uh, that is seated on the throne of heaven. So if you think about it, Memtet really is Yeshua. Memtet really is God manifest. So, so uh, we don't have time to um, explore that, but. Um, uh, but here they're saying that it, it, it could be my Archangel Michael, which sometimes uh, referred to as Memtet. Remember, in rabbinic writing, the Messiah is referred to like a gazelle. You know what a gazelle is? It's an animal that runs very fast. And, and when he's running, in, and when you see him in the field, sometimes he shows up when he leaps, and sometimes he disappears. Sometimes he leaves. Yeah, sometimes you can see him. Sometimes you can't see him. So, so he, it's alluding to the Messiah. Some, sometimes the Messiah appears and then disappears. Appears again and disappears. So we see it throughout the Torah. You see it all throughout the Tanakh. We can see it all throughout the scripture where, where, where uh, when Hashem appears himself like a man, like an angel disguises himself why because god can take on any form he is god right so in this case you know he can he can appear as a man he can appear as an angel so let's go back to what jacob was experiencing what did jacob say so so uh so when uh, when he saw that he prevailed that against him talking about uh, the man that he was wrestling with he touched the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of jacob's thigh was strained as they wrestled with him and he said let me go for the day break it and he said i will not let you except you bless me so here we see that it cannot be a demon because a demon cannot bless you and he said to him what is your name and he said jacob and he said thy name shall no more be called jacob but israel for thou hast striven with god and with men and has prevailed and in verse 30 jacob asked him he said tell me i pray thee what is thy name and he but he never said, look, listen, he never, or the Lord never records what he said. He said, wherefore is it thou dost ask after my name? Why do you ask? And, and why do you ask my name? And then he said, he blessed them, blessed him there. Verse 31, Jacob called the name of the place, Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. So, so here, interesting, what is Jacob saying? Jacob is calling the place God, Hashem, the face of God, the divine face. Who is Yeshua? Yeshua is the manifestation of Hashem. Yeshua is in fact the divine face of God. Jacob will not call it the face of God if it, it was the, if 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 it if he was wrestling with a demon or if he was wrestling with somebody else. Yeshua is the face of God. Because I have seen his the face of God just like Minoah. Remember Minoah, the father of Samson. Uh, when the when the angel, which uh, we know is the the, the pre um, manifestation of Yeshua, when Manoah met the man, the angel, and as they were serving the food and the and and as the as he uh, the food went, uh, the smoke came up, the the uh, Yeshua went up with him and Manoah began to cry, oh. Wow, I, I, I'm going to die. I've seen the face, the face of God. Manoah knew that this angel who was really Hashem. So another um, interesting uh, type relating to the angel, because uh, um, in, in, um, in one of the uh, footnotes uh, to Rabbi Eliezer's um, commentary on the Torah talking about the angel the angel he said is called Israel interesting in in Genesis Rabbah 28 3 and Sanhedrin 37b again uh, in uh, Numbers Rabbah 10 6 the idea this of this um, of this passage talking about the angel is named says according to the mission entrusted to him by God so let's let's follow that logic here it says here so when uh, so when Jacob um, 
when the angel was sent to Jacob, um, namely that the, they said the angel's name was Israel, the, the warrior of God, it, the one that will prevail with God. Destiny, it says here that the destiny of the Jewish people of Israel or Jacob uh, and his seed is, is to do battle with everything which opposes the establishment on earth of God's kingdom. So what is the purpose uh, of Israel? It, um, the, what's, what's Israel is supposed to do? Israel is supposed to war against anything that opposes the kingdom of God. And how do they do that exactly? Uh, well, the weapons that they use is prayer, study, and applying the word of God in their lives. Talking about taking the things of this earth and elevating it. They're talking about... Uh, bringing the Torah to the world, infusing God's instruction and commandments and applying it to the world. So therefore the angel is named Israel. So, so according to the Midrash, the name of the angel that Jacob wrestled was Israel. Wow. So not, so why is that significant? Why is that, why is that important? Israel must he says, must fear neither man or angel as he prevailed over the power above man and need not fear, on, but only God. So, so remember, um, uh, in the case of Minoah, the angel, he said, what is your name? Minoah asked him, he said, my name, why are you asking me? Name? My name is Pele or hidden or mystery or wonderful. So we understand that the mission of Samson his mission was hidden, meaning the, the power and strength of Samson was secret, was hidden. And, uh, and later on, Samson reveals this to Delilah, and uh, that's where he loses his eyesight because he said, you know, if you put roses around me when I'm sleeping, you know, I lose my power. And, and if you try if tie a rope around me, so none of that worked because the, the true secret of his power was the, the hair. Anyway, so we, we know the, 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 the anointing of the Holy Spirit because he was in Nazarite vow. So anyway, so the angel's name is interesting was hidden. Again, uh, that's the name of the Messiah. He said uh, his name is hidden. It also means wonderful. It said Isaiah chapter verse 9, chapter 9 says, what is the, his name is uh, everlasting God. His name is wonderful, counselor, prince of peace. So, so all of that. So again, let's go back to the to the idea that according to uh, to the footnote, the name is actually Israel. So again, why is why is that important? Why am I re-emphasizing the name of the angel? Why? Because going back to the to the Isaiah chapter fifty three, when you talk to um, Jews today that are that don't believe in the Yeshua as the Messiah, they will tell you that Isaiah fifty three is not referring to an individual, but to Israel. Now we can see the, the, the debate where not, it is not talking about the Messiah, but the nation of Israel. The answer is yes, it is both referring to the Messiah and referring to Israel because Israel and the Messiah, the name of the Messiah is also Israel. Wow. So Messiah is embodiment of Israel. Just like in this case, we have an angel who is named Israel, who is telling Jacob, your name now is Israel. What? Jacob's name is now Israel. The angel's name is Israel. So Jacob is now named after the divine name, divine being named Israel, which is really the manifestation of Yeshua, Yeshua the Messiah. So the scriptures say, so when we talk about the Isaiah 53, yes, it's referring to Israel. Yes, it's referring to the Messiah because they are one and the same. So because people who are called by name shall humble. So here we see that now we understand Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, when it says, My people who are called by my name. Who are these people? The children of Israel. Who is called by my, whose name? The name of Israel, because that's the name of God. Another name of God is Israel. Wow. So the people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and will turn from their wicked way. So, so here we clearly see, wow. Israel is the name of God too. So that is why we have to open ourselves up to the truth 
and set aside religious bias. Remember, the Jews always believe that God can manifest himself as an angel of a human being up until perhaps the Middle Ages, the 1500s, when, when the persecution of Jewish people started to escalate. And the reason the Jews started uh, to move away from, from God manifesting himself in the flesh is due to the Crusades and the persecution of the Jewish people, the pogroms. The last thing they wanted to do is validate the teaching of JC, which is killing them. So they said, how can this Messiah, if he's really the Messiah of Israel, why is this JC guy killing us? Why? Because that is not the teaching of Yeshua. That is born out of replacement, the evils of replacement theology. Um, and, and therefore, the, the Jewish people were, were persecuted because of the false teaching that emanated from replacement theology. So the challenge for us is uh, many today, they have no problem with, with, uh, with, the, with the word of God as long as, here, here's, here's the key, as long as it does not interfere with their core beliefs, with their core tradition, with their core practices, they have no problem with it. But the moment that the word of God challenges that, the truth of God's word, even though it, the truth is right in front of them, right? You know, God said, he, this is what God said. And yet people will still uh, walk away from that. Why? Why? Because they need to be broken. We need to to um, to be like little children. As she was said, unless you become like little children, what is a little child? A little child is teachable. They have a humble heart. They listen. They want to learn. As long as we have that attitude, the truth will always be with us. But the moment that we become like Esau, who from the very beginning re rejected, he, he, he had his own mindset, he had his own idea of what, uh, what he wanted to do, and he didn't care about the mission, and that's what happens. So, uh, so here, uh, you know, God is challenging us. You know, we need to move away from Babylon. We need to move away from paganism. We, do, we need to seek the word, the truth of God's word. So uh, it's a challenge for us. And, and again, you know, it, it, it's the true believers. Are you really a believer or are you, um, or are you just a, a follower of the world? If you're a follower of the world, then the, the kingdom of God is not for you. It, 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 God's kingdom is not forced. The religion cannot be forced on anyone. God's, God is a melech. He is a king that has volunteer subjects. You know, the world is going to, uh, in, in a few months in, or maybe in the next year, religion will force, it will, they will force Sunday worship. Again, this is, uh, um, this is not uh, fantasy. This is uh, what we're, we're nearing the end. Uh, God's people will be determined whether they, they, will, they will follow the word of God or they, they will follow the word of man. So, um, uh, the anti-Messiah is defying, is, is defying be, uh, true believers now. Are you going to follow the word of God or are you going to follow me, the, 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 the anti-Messiah? So, you know, we're, we're getting to the point now where, you know, a lot of people, you know, they're, they're, they're unaware. Why? There's no excuse. We, we, we have the word of, the, the, we, we, we are the most learned. We are the most, um, we are the generation of to, of information, of knowledge, uh, as prophesied in Daniel, where knowledge will be increased and uh, people will move to and fro. We are the generation. We are, we are it. We are the generation of knowledge and, and movement. And God is, and, and we are about to be tested. You know, the, the word of God is there to test us whether or not our heart is with him. So, so, um, you know, I, I, I just want to encourage each one of you who's listening today. You know, we need to get out of Babylon. We need to, to get out of our pagan ways and move on to the things of God. 
there's you know there, it, it's not it's not time to to play cute or to play to play um, um, you know uh, trying to be uh, you know we, we claim to to love God and serve God no it's time to really um, stand for the truth and live for the truth so Jacob returns and um, um, he's reunited with Esau for the first time after 20 years Jacob lifted his eyes and looked and behold Esau came with 400 of his men uh, he divided the children into Leah and to Rachel and unto his two handmaids. In verse 3, and when he finally reached where Esau was, he, he himself passed over before him and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. So at the, by the time of uh, Jacob's arrival, it says uh, there's uh, many uh, recent, uh, they're saying Esau's men, when, when has been disheartened they said to fight Jacob why some say that there was the band of angels uh, that uh, came with Jacob's party and they look they look very strong very powerful and uh, Esau's men were discouraged because of the manifestation of warrior angels some say this that the change of heart of Esau was the effect of the gifts that uh, Esau received and also when he saw the offerings of Jacob. Um, but there's some interesting um, insight here because they, they, um, when Jacob um, uh, moved uh, or crossed over, he, it says that he crossed over his 11 sons, his uh, two wives and the, the maid servants. But there's no mention of Dinah. There's no mention of Dinah. It's interesting that Dinah was not mentioned or there's no mention or reference. It says here in the writing, Jacob said what was said to be very protective of Dinah. Why? Because Dinah um, had the personality of Leah. They said she was very outgoing. She was very charismatic. Uh, she was very influential. And, and at the same time, she had the beauty of Rachel. So Jacob was protecting Dinah. In fact, the, the sages say that Jacob hid Dinah from Esau. So that's interesting um, why the Jewish writing um, says that. Because the sages said that Jacob, Jacob should have given Dinah over to Esau, uh, either for his son for marriage. And therefore, the repentance of Esau would have been completed. So the, what they're saying is uh, J, uh, Esau, when he saw the gifts, perhaps when he saw the angels, perhaps when, when he saw the children, he had a change of heart. He said, oh, I'm not going to kill Jacob anymore. Uh, so he started to repent on trying to kill Jacob. And then the sages said that had Jacob given Dinah over to Esau's, to Esau's family, then the repentance would have been completed for Esau. Because remember, they said that, yes, uh, Esau was a very... Uh, stubborn evil man but they said that Dinah was so charismatic that she could have influenced Jacob or Esau otherwise so what they say so so we know what happened history tells us that um, that Esau later became Rome which became the Christians and the Christians were the greatest persecutor of the Jewish people in fact there's so many Jews Jewish families that were killed either killed or they were forced converted or they were taken away uh, their culture their identity taken away and you know it continues even to the end of time the great the, the great battle will be between rome and israel rome representing christianity in the last day so we were seeing we're seeing that now where the vatican is so anti-israel and they're even more uh, recognizing the the state of Palestine, which is uh, a country that never existed until recently. You know, uh, uh, there's no talk about Palestine, all, only Arabs, um, but non Palestine. So so here so so um, so here we see that in the original text that when Esau ran to meet him, they embraced, they fell on his, on his neck and kissed him. And the Hebrew word there for kiss him, you'll notice I highlighted in red here. In the Torah scroll, you'll see that 
every letter has a bite mark or a dot indicating some say that uh, um, it is uh, a bite mark the sages believe that the kiss of esau was hypocritical that left a bite mark on jacob's neck thus the insistence of jacob to for them to travel alone and not have Esau is courting. So if, if, if they have truly, uh, if Jacob really felt that uh, Esau has repented of the plan to kill him, it would have been a great reunion. He, said, he could have said, Esau, yes, you know, it's been 20 years. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's travel together. Let's have some uh, chatting, you know, uh, let's catch up. or doing. But Jacob felt that, you know, um, we better get away from this guy. You know, he, he seems unstable. So, so that's why Jacob um, wanted to uh, to travel alone and, and made an, made which is a, a valid issue. Saying we are a, a slow traveling uh, caravan, we don't want to slow you down, and we certainly cannot catch up with you lest the animals will die. So, um, so you can see here the dilemma. So there's some interesting insight here because um, Esau starts out in Seir, and then he also returns to Seir. But Jacob, but Jacob, instead of uh, uh, moving, he 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 journeyed to Sukkot. So the place that he journeyed is called Sukkot. So again, there's some interesting um, insight on the journey because Esau started uh, that day. On his journey to see from Seir, so Rabbi Monk, an ancient um, commentary to the Bible or the Torah, he says for Esau the destination, the goal, the aim was Seir, but for Jacob, his destination is Sukkot. Notice that the Torah describes Esau, who started uh, uh, towards Seir. In other words, the Torah is saying Seir was the starting point but it was supposed to start from the starting point so when he met jacob J he, uh, jacob um, he was he should have been influenced by jacob to go to sukkot so what is what is that what does that mean so it means here that jacob uh instead of going forward with jacob the insight says because the, the because the two names seer and sukkot reveal a divergence between the Christian and the Jewish thought. So in Esau's case, uh, he sees the highest expression of his religious idea of the nation of Seir, which is in, in Strong's 8165 means goat. Goat. So Seir means goat. So it's a direct connection with Esau uh, in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 8. The concept of Esau is the scapegoat are all connected. So what it is saying here that Esau was going back to where it all began. He was going back to the scapegoat. Why? Because in his mind, this is the highest level of his religious experience. No, in other words, he is stuck at the scapegoat. He stopped, he's stuck at the crucifixion. He's stuck at the altar. This is where Jacob or Esau starts and ends he said the most important thing is to is here this is it they're stuck with the death of the messiah in the re res resurrection of the messiah you're you're kind of stuck the people have been taught at, at, in, that in the beginning is actually a journey and a destination as a result people don't go don't grow from there they don't they do they do not tame their inner esau the idea includes the principle of redemption and absolution appearing as, as acts of grace which emanate from divine love. Yes, it is true. Yes, you know, uh, the altar is important. Yeah, where, this is where we get our redemption. This is where we get our freedom. But from here, what, what God is saying, you know what? You know, I want you to enter in. You're, don't stay here. I want you to enter in. Get... Uh, get baptized, get converted. I want you to enter in, you know, uh, partake of the 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 showbread and the menorah, the altar of incense, so that we can fellowship. So it so so, so it says here that 
grace which emanates grace is great the scapegoat is all about redemption it's it's all about absolution it's all about uh, god's divine love it's all true wonderful but this is where we begin that we begin at redemption we have our sins wiped away we begin with the love of god drawing us by faith we begin but we don't stay there that's why you know the 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 first feast is we start out with Rosh Hashanah, with the, the, the days of all, the repentance, and then in Yom Kippur we get we get our atonement, we get our sins forgiven, and then what happens next? This is where the rubber meets the road. So when we turn our life, if we are truly born again, then we begin to enter in, we begin to walk the walk, the ways of God, and we enter into the sukkah or the, the the feast of Sukkot, the feast of Tabernacles. We enter into the joyous celebration with God to eternity. So that's that's the that is what it's alluding to. Um, the, the Jewish thought goes further, go, does not consider the absolution, the, the scapegoat of Yom Kippur to be the final climax. That is what the journey from Egypt. That's why you remember when when God took them out of Egypt. Why did God not take them to the promised land? The promised land represents heaven. God did not take them from freedom to heaven. What did he do? He took them south where he took them to Mount Sinai where they received the covenant. Why, why is the covenant? Why is the Torah so important? Why the Torah? It teaches us about God. It teaches us about his ways. It teaches us how we can be like him. And when we when we uh, when we live that when we learn that when we live that in our lives the more we do the more we become the more we become like him so when we are like him then we are able to enter the promised land remember many came many came many died why many refused they wanted to go back to the world many you know they said oh we want it but we don't want it so the only people that were able to enter the promised land were those that were uh, that were uh, obedient to the word of God. So here, so here's the pattern that is showing us. You know, it, it started out Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur happened at the beginning of the year, not at the end. Why? Because we begin our journey with forgiveness, but we don't stay there. Forgiveness leads us to Sukkot. That's why. You know, when 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 in Zechariah chapter 14, all the nations will have to keep Sukkot. Eventually, the people learn to go beyond the scapegoat to the Sukkah. So, so God is saying, you know, we when when we when we have repented, you know, our the, the next thing that happens after we get our forgiveness, what do we do? Do we go back to the pit that we came from, or do we move forward and say, God, you know what? I'm truly. Uh, thankful for my forgiveness now i want to live for you so we start moving we start walking the paths of torah so when we go beyond yom kippur we have you have to now act on our teshuva or our repentance that is the beauty of torah observance because it gives us the opportunity to make good on the teshuva on the repentance we acknowledge this both it is both a path to righteousness for us and, and a test for us. Did we really mean what we say? Did we really repent? Or are we going back to our old ways? Are we really born again? Are we really, had we really laid our lives down on the cross or on the altar? Did we die to self? Or do we continue to be living a self-centered life? So um, we learn here that again, again that God's uh, plan A for Dinah was for for um, for him for her to be married to Esau. Remember, Esau missed out on Leah. Remember, Leah is the only one who had a daughter. Why? Because Esau was destined. God's plan for was for Esau to marry Leah, but he rejected God's plan. So now God is giving him another chance. But Jacob held back Dinah so what happened so again D Dinah's character is like Leah very outgoing she is very influential she uh, she wanted to 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 share the truth of God to the to the to the women in Shechem so she wanted and anyway to cut the long story short um, 
you know, th th she was so charismatic. She was so beautiful and you know the, you know she just attracted you know the, the the light of god was upon is upon her life and 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 uh, anyway so we know the story we don't want to go into detail but uh, um so to cut the long story short it says rabbi eliezer says that dinah later became pregnant from shechem and gave birth to a daughter Interesting, the brothers rejected the daughter of Dinah because she's a product of rape. So they rejected their niece and Jacob this time seeks the guidance of Hashem. Hashem, what do, what do we do with his baby? So God told uh, Jacob, this is again from the Jewish writings, that um, to bring the, the, the baby to an Egyptian couple, that didn't have any children. The, the Egyptian couple was Potiphira, the priest of On. So they, uh, this, the God told them that to that the this couple doesn't have a daughter, doesn't have children. So that uh, so Potiphira adopted her and became her adopted daughter, who she named Osnat. And see what happens. See, see God's plan. You know, God, you know um, what, it, what? You know, all things work together for good to them that love God, and to them that live according to His purpose. Romans eight twenty eight. So here, what happened? So after that, what happened? When Jacob, I'm oh, sorry, when Joseph came into power, was elevated to the interesting. See, interesting how God works. Remember, when Pharaoh realized that there's no one wiser than Joseph, Joseph. Pharaoh didn't offer one of her daughters, but he said, marry the daughter of Potiphar. Wow. So Joseph was elevated, became viceroy of Egypt. He was being paraded around Egypt. Women were naturally attracted to him, but Joseph marries and, and marries who? The daughter of Potiphar, which is really her biological niece. Interesting. Interesting, and on the union, they bore Ephraim and Manasseh. Despite the tragedy, she has see Hashem's hand. Dinah was outgoing and said he had a mission mind. Evangelist, her daughter ended up becoming the wife of Joseph and learned later in the, mid, in the Midrashic text that Joseph really was elevated to the viceroy and he became... Uh, he became really the savior of the world. Wow. Uh, I thought that was interesting. Now, now to um, um, on the way, Rachel, Rachel dies. So uh, Genesis chapter 35, this is where we're going to end our lesson today. Genesis chapter 35, talking about the death of Rachel. As they journeyed from Bethel, there was but a little way to come to Ephra, and Rachel travailed. And she had labor. So what's that interesting when, when Rachel was about to die and the baby was coming out, and she was departing her soul, for she died. But she called the name of his son Benoni. Benoni. The Benoni in Hebrew means the son of my sorrow. And later, when, when but Jacob, but his father called him Benjamin. And Rachel died and was buried in Ephrat. So here, there's some interesting. Again, you know. Uh, the death of Rachel again connects back to the Messiah. The Messiah, Rachel names her Benoni, the son of my sorrow. It refers to the first coming of Yeshua. And then Jacob names him Benjamin, again, the son of my right hand, talking about the second coming of the Messiah, coming as the king of David, the son of David. So Rachel, um, Israel is called Rachel. So Rachel's name is, sim is symbolic of all Israel. As it says in the Midrash, Ra Rachel's, R Raquel's name means ewe or lamb, female lamb. Rachel, remember in Genesis chapter 29, verse 9, he took care of sheep. And listen, uh, Jacob, Israel, mourns for the death of her sheep. Wow. So she named him Benoni in reference to the future sorrows of Israel for which she would mourn, Jeremiah 31, 14. Rachel weeping for her children. The two names, uh, so Rachel's the, uh, son point to Messiah Ben Benoni, points to the first coming of, of Benjamin, 
uh, first coming, and Benjamin points to the second coming. Benoni, son of my trouble, sorrow, this decried the Messiah who is supposed to make war against the nations of Israel, and they, they, in the writings he will die in battle. This describes the first coming of Yeshua, as it says in Matthew 10, 34. It says, uh, it says there, don't suppose that I come to bring peace to the land. It's not peace that I have come to bring but a sword. Remember the great exile of the Jewish people from their homeland and the terrible things that have happened in the past 2,000 years all started with the coming of Yeshua. That's why he is the son of trouble for Israel indeed. However, when Messiah returns, though, he will be seated at the right hand of the Father. Jacob refers to, uh, to this by the name Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. Psalm 80, verse 17, and Psalm 110, verse 1, refers to the Messiah being at the right hand, seated at the right hand of the Father to make their enemies the footstool of his feet. So it's interesting that um, Jacob buries Rachel where in Bethlehem in Ephrata. So he journeyed in Bethel. So, so the question is, why is Rachel buried in Ephrat? The same is Bethlehem, and Jacob set up a pillar upon her grave. The same is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. In the Midrash, as an explanation as to why Rachel was buried in Ephrat instead of the cave of Machpelah, where the rest of the, uh, the patriarchs and the matriarchs are buried. Remember, uh, Adam and Eve was buried in Machpelah, the cave of Machpelah, Abraham and Sarah, um, Isaac and Rebekah, and later on Jacob and Leah. Why was Rachel not buried in, Ephra, in uh, Machpelah? So they said that Jacob buried Rachel on the way to Ephrath because Jacob foresaw that on when the children of Israel will be exiled, that they would pass by the grave of Rachel so she could pray for mercy on them as it written, Rachel weeping for his children. So Jacob set up a pillar over Rachel's grave to stand as a monument for future generations. It will remain a monument unto this day, meaning until the Messiah comes back. Since Rachel's life is really an allusion to the life of Messiah Ben Yosef. So here, you know, the Rachel's tomb is in, is symbolism of uh, of of Messiah Ben Yosef because Yosef was his child. So it's it's referring to the first coming of Yeshua. Yeshua crying, interceding for the children of Israel. That's why Yeshua's empty empty tomb is the place of hope and redemption. So uh, so uh, the connection of Rachel and Yeshua. Remember when Yeshua was born, Matthew chapter 2, there's a connection between Rachel and the birth of Yeshua. It's here. It says um, in verse 17, in this way were fulfilled the words spoken by the prophet Jeremiah or Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah sobbing and lamenting loudly. It was Rachel sobbing for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no longer alive. So here, the birth of Yeshua, remember King Herod, when he learned that the wise man came and told them they saw the sign. And when the wise man did not come back, he carried out his plan of mass infanticide um, and killed all baby Jewish boy, two years and under. Again, Rachel let out another cry for her children. Uh, he, uh, his last, uh, so it is said that Rachel to this day weeps for her children, but one day God will comfort Rachel and her losses will be repaid in full. In Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 15, that says the Lord, refrain thy voice from weeping and thy eyes from tears, for the work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and they shall come back to the land of their enemies. So God is promising 
and speaks of the day when Messiah will return and gather the people of Israel back to the land of Israel, where he will rule over the world under under Torah and establish one world government and one world religion. Are you excited today? Are you excited? Are you excited for the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah to finally rule and reign? So to conclude today, Hashem's desire, God's desire for us is to walk in the path that He has laid for us. Why? So we can live with Him in eternity. The redemption of Yeshua is our starting point. Let's go beyond the starting point. Let's go beyond the, the altar. We are to enter in. It means that only to hear, to learn, and to obey. The Torah is the way. The Torah is the truth. The Torah is the life. Why? Because Yeshua is the living Torah. So are you ready to enter in today? Let's pray. Elvino Malkano, our Father and our King, we thank you for today's teaching today. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for your Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit, who is teaching each and every one of us. We are believing for a great miracle this month of Keslev, the, the, the month of great miracles. We, we I pray for uh, my brothers and sisters, whatever breakthrough they are waiting for, Father, this is the month of your fulfillment and we declare it over their lives nothing is impossible with you father we thank you we praise you we we lift up uh, anybody today anybody listening um whatever wherever you are whatever situation you're facing in i am telling you today today is your day yeshua hamashiach is there to deliver you and to uh, to uh, break and, and bring the breakthrough that you're waiting for in your life and we thank you today, Father. You're gonna, uh, you're gonna bring fire from heaven to answer the prayers of your people today. And we thank you. We praise you. We give you all the glory and all the honor in Yeshua the Messiah. We pray, Amen and Amen. And I thank you guys for listening. Uh, if you're new to the channel, we encourage you to uh, to uh, subscribe. And uh, please uh, take the time to sign in to your YouTube account and uh, like us. Uh, uh, and or if you don't like the teaching, please send comments. We 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 don't have a we we have a big heart. We want to learn. We want to know what people are are thinking. If you have any questions? Anything that was not clear? We welcome that. Um, and again, you know, we we thank you for for your faithfulness. May the Lord. The Lord told Moses to tell Aaron to bless the people, and so are you blessed today. Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord let his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Peace in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. By the way, I forgot to uh, make an announcement. Uh, uh, Rosh, um, Hanukkah is coming starting November 28th uh, sundown. So if you want to join us, we have a Zoom link. If you are interested, please uh, go to the website. It's uh, All the Zoom information is there or send us an email or send us a text. So see you again next time. Shabbat Shalom, everyone.